Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Anglican Church. If you could all start moving towards your seats and close out your conversations so that we can reorient our hearts towards the Lord this morning. Just waiting for a few other conversations to stop. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> A couple more people ready for, your, for conversations to stop, please, if everyone could listen up. Thank you. So as we settle our hearts this morning, uh, a couple of things I want to hold before you on this particular Sunday. One is we've been doing the this, this series for the past several weeks of remembering who we are as we step into the future that God has for us as Emmanuel, uh, our vocation which is caught up in our name, Emmanuel, God with us for the sake of others. And then that's expressed in three primary ways, in worship, in grow, and then this week in serve. So that's what we'll be focusing on this morning. And most of you probably have heard before that when we, the word liturgy has its roots in the meaning of the word, the work of the people. It comes from a Greek word that means the work of the people. So the liturgy that we are doing this morning, and we even call this a Sunday morning service. The reason we call it a service is that we are here to serve the Lord in our worship and our serving each other, actually, even in our worship and our prayers. This is actually one of the main ways that we serve our society and our culture is in our worship of God and in our prayer uh, for each other and for our nation. And so we are gathered this morning together in this opportunity to serve the Lord in our worship. So we're going to orient our hearts that way this morning. And secondly, with this being the, the Sunday in which we are going to bring our pledges, our pledge cards before the Lord, one of the ways in which we serve is in the offering of our resources and our finances in partnership with God for this work that he's doing in and through Emmanuel in this world. So preparing our hearts for that moment as well um, in the service when we will be offering these uh, pledges and as, as a symbol of offering our entire lives to the Lord. So I invite you now to, for a moment of, of silence and quiet and reorienting our hearts together. Uh, and Jordan, as you can begin to play and I'll open us with prayer. The Lord be with you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that the, for the reality that before we even begin to serve you, you did the amazing thing as creator of the universe in serving us first and most profoundly in Jesus, you yourself as God becoming human. To, you came <clears throat> not to be served, but to serve. And in your serving of us, you have brought us into life with your Father. So we turn our hearts to you this morning uh, to receive from your Holy Spirit the reorienting that we all need today. I encourage you to quietly continue your own attitude of prayer now. I invite you to stand together so that we can sing of the wideness of God's mercy.
Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And blessed be His kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Set us free, loving Father, from the bondage of our sins, and in your goodness and mercy give us the liberty of that abundant life which you have made known to us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Children and teachers, if you'll come to the center, we'll sing our blessing over you together here. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Lord turn his face toward you. for the reading of God's Word.
The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 58. Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger, and spinking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness, and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong and you shall be like a watered garden like a spring of water whose waters do not fail and your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt you shall raise up the foundations of many generations you shall be called the repairer of the breach the restorer of streets to dwell in the word of the lord Our psalm today is Psalm 100, and we'll read it together. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are, his, we are the people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. The second reading is from Romans chapter 10. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him in, of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord and James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one on your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, King of glory, you came not to be served, but to serve and to give your life as a ransom for many. And we standing here before you right now are those for whom you gave your life. Uh, you have brought us back and have bought us back. Uh, from sin and Satan and have set us within the embrace of your Father. And now we want to live our lives in response to you and in service of you. Uh, may my words this morning uh, serve you well. Uh, be with my mouth and teach my lips what to say. I ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In my early 20s, I unintentionally insulted a cowboy, a real cowboy. My dad, my younger brother, and I we were on a, a 70, 70, not 7, not 17, 70-mile 70 trail ride out in West Texas. I was impressed on this trail ride by the trail boss, the cowboy who guided us all along the way. Gruff, but attentive. He adjusted people's stirrups. He helped people with their gear. He checked in on the stragglers. He was always the one when we came to the gates that he would be the one to dismount the gate, open the gate, make sure everyone passed through okay. Then he would close the gate, mount back up, and continue riding along the way, checking in on people all throughout the day. At one point on the, the third or Second or third day riding alongside, I found myself actually riding alongside the trail boss, this cowboy. And so I turned to him and said, I want you to know that I really appreciate your servant's heart. He slowly looked over at me from under the brim of his hat and he said, boy, what the heck? He didn't say heck. What the heck are you talking about? I said, well, I, you're, you're such a good servant. The way that you're taking good care of all of us, you're a real servant leader. And he just stared at me the way that only a cowboy can under the brim of his hat. And then he snorted. And then he nudged his horse and broke into a trot and went further up the line. 
the last conversation I had with him until uh, the fourth day when he came up alongside me. I was in so much pain from, walk, from riding a horse that, that distance. I was walking beside my horse. My horse was so exhausted, his head was resting on my shoulder. And we're walking, and he rode up beside me, and he said, boy, next road, I'm having the trailer meet you, and you guys are riding the truck the rest of the way. I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I didn't mention anything about him being a good servant at that particular point. Because calling someone a servant in so much of the world might not be received as a compliment. It might not be a good idea to use that word. But among Christians, it should be considered one of the highest compliments because it's saying that you are growing into who God wants you to be, someone like Jesus. Remember last week when we talked about the end of growth, where it is that our growth is going, what it is intended for us to grow into. We were looking at Ephesians 4 where Paul says that we are to grow into little Christs both as individuals and as a community, to be those who experience and express the fullness of Jesus. That's what we're growing into. And the fullness of Jesus is one who fully loves God, heart, soul, and mind, like we say every Sunday morning, and one who loves his neighbor as himself, or in other words, a true worshiper of God. In the Gospel of John, it's part of the story that many of you know, there's a moment when we see what Jesus embodying this kind of love, this kind of worship, this kind of service looks like. John writes and says, When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world and go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end very similar word there in the Greek to the end of our growth that's in Ephesians. The fullness, the maturity of what it is to be someone who loves neighbor and loves God. How did he do this? He laid aside his outer, gar- outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and he began to wash the disciples' feet. Jesus, the servant, Jesus, the slave, the slave of all. Remember, he washes Judas's feet in this moment. The full expression of our worship, the evidence of our growth in Christ, is being a servant, being a slave. And I'm using those two words, servant and slave, intentionally, Because those are the words used by Jesus in that reading that we had from Mark's gospel this morning when he summarizes what his mission is on earth. And it's the same mission to which he is calling his disciples then and that he calls us as his disciples now. In that passage, he uses the word diakonos, which is what we get our word deacon from. A diakonos is one who serves one who is tasked with meeting others' needs, one who is to take care of them. And it is largely one who chooses to serve, who steps into this role, is called into this role. Jesus says, whoever would be great among you must be your diakonos, your servant. And he also uses the word doulos, which means slave. Sometimes in your Bibles, it'll be translated as bond servant. Because this is one who is bonded to another. It's someone who is actually forced to serve another, whether it's through financial debt or through being a captive in war. When you're a doulos, you no longer belong to yourself. The will of another person is now your master. Whoever would be first among you, says Jesus, must be the doulos of all. Everyone else's will becomes the priority and you are subservient, sold into slavery to everyone else. And it's not just the disciples that Jesus calls into servitude here. This is what's amazing to me. This is the call on God in the flesh, Jesus himself. This is his mission. 
For even the Son of Man, even I, Jesus, your rabbi, master, king, as they will discover one day their God, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as the ransom for many. A two-part mission of Jesus, to serve and to save. And his mission is our mission. So it brings us full circle back to our vocational name that we began talking about several weeks ago. Emmanuel, God with us for the sake of others. Jesus bringing us into life with God, saving us, bringing us into life with God as true worshipers, and then our growing in Jesus so that we participate with him in cultivating shalom and Sabbath in our homes, our neighborhoods, our nation, and our world. In other words, so that we grow in becoming servants and slaves to others. And so this is where we come to our final week of remembering who we are. Our vocation that is expressed and experienced in worship, grow, and serve. And this morning, focusing on serve. And there are three elements in serving that I want to hold before you this morning. To be servants, we need humble hearts. We need compassionate action. And we need bold truth-telling. This is what it means to be a servant of God and a servant of people. Humble hearts, compassionate action, and bold truth-telling. And beginning with humble hearts. To serve in the way that Jesus serves requires a humble heart. Listen to these words from Paul's letter to the Philippians. We didn't have it in the readings this morning, but I'm going to read it to you here. Paul writes to the Philippians and says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This mind doesn't come from outside ourselves. It comes from Christ Jesus reforming, renewing our minds in this way. Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a doulos, a slave. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. There's the reality, there's the model, there's the image for a humble heart. And Paul, always the practical one, tells us how this plays out in real life. What does it look like to have a humble heart in our day-to-day -day life with each other? In the preceding sentences, he writes, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, humbling yourself, having humble hearts, count others more significant than yourselves, and let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. In other words, having this humble heart means that we are to live as though others are more important than we are. That we have hearts that put the needs and desires of other people's hearts ahead of our own. This is what it looks like to have a humble heart. And that could seriously alter behavior and relationships, couldn't it? If at home, in our friendships, at work, at school, at church, in the world, in the way that we interact, that we are putting other people's interests ahead of our own. That we're putting their needs, their desires, their wants before our own. And those are the choices that we make first to serve, to have humble hearts in that way. That's hard. <laughs> that is not easy to do. That is not how my heart is wired to put other people's needs ahead of my own. It's actually comes close to being impossible, at least on a consistent basis, without Jesus. And so, like Jesus, in this reading from Philippians, this is where we begin. We begin by humbling ourselves before God first. Instead of trying to grasp at controlling our world, trying to get our own needs met, trying to get our own wants met, being like little gods ourselves, or even trying to grasp at controlling our hearts and forcing ourselves to be humble-hearted like this, we need to choose that classic line that we've heard most of our lives now, to let go 
and let God. We turn to God and say, God, we need you. Apart from you, we can't do these things. And God then sends Jesus to be with us in our struggles, sends Jesus to be with us in our lives, and then Jesus serves us by reforming our hearts, providing us what we need for inner change, forgiveness that opens up the space for grace to come in and for the Holy Spirit to enter our lives and to do that transforming work of creating humble hearts in us. And even that very action there of Jesus coming to be with us and providing us what we need for change, that points towards the second element of serving, compassionate action. The root meaning of the English word compassion that we use, it it's has its roots in the Latin, the root meaning of it is a suffering with another. Calm means with, passion means means suffering. Compassion is going to be with the ones who are suffering and suffering and sharing with them in their suffering. You're not at a distance from someone when you're compassionate. You're up close and personal the way that Jesus is with us. And like Jesus, we're to share what we have to help address the suffering that others are going through. It's why I chose the, the reading from my, the prophet Isaiah this morning. And I see in these words in Isaiah two forms of compassionate action. There's compassion that, <clears throat> compassionate action that meets the immediate need of people. And there's compassionate action that addresses what actually causes that need. Is this not the fast that I choose? to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke. There's what causes all these needs, these yokes, this wickedness, the oppression. And then comes the words about how the immediate needs are also being met. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Do you hear the call to compassionate action? To meet the immediate needs of your own family and of our church family and of our neighbors and of our neighborhoods and even of our nation. Feeding the hungry, finding shelter for those without homes, driving people to doctor's appointments providing school supplies for kids, guiding people struggling with depression and anxiety toward professional help. The list goes on and on and on because the needs go on and on and on. And among the things that I love about Emmanuel is this is, we've long been committed to this kind of compassion and action. You see it in the way that we take care of each other here at Emmanuel. In the inReach ministry that Mike Harpster is coordinating, helping us care for each other when practical needs arise. You see it in the pastoral care that we do here and in the Stephen ministers when they come alongside to listen to people. With our prayer ministers, they lay hands on people and pray for them for needs to be met. Our setup teams, the altar guild, the ministry partners that we have like Life First Pregnancy Center. Kairos that goes into prison, CCOM and ACTS that's addressing the day-to-day -day immediate needs of people with housing and hunger and mental health needs and abuse. Compassionate action that attends to people's immediate needs. And there's also this call to compassionate action to address the cause of people's needs. In Isaiah, it's those references that I mentioned to the bonds of wickedness, the straps of the yoke, the oppression. Isaiah is talking there about persons, practices, and systems that are in place within cultures that prevent people from having their needs met, that enable those with greater power and resources to devalue and to mistreat others that warp the thinking of entire generations to believe that something other than creator God defines who they are and how they are to live. Corrupted rulers, organizations, and people. The influence of idolatry, evil, and evil spirits. The reality, to put it in one word, of sin. 
Our culture also suffers from these causes, and Christ-like serving involves addressing them as well. Which brings me to the third element of serving, which is bold truth-telling, this final element of what it means to serve. And there are a range of ways in which God's church is called to compassionate action in all of these areas. Like Jesus, sharing in life with the suffering ones and meeting immediate needs. And like Jesus, speaking bold, true words in every circumstance that addresses the corrupted oppression that is behind those needs. Spiritual, personal, and societal. But God's church has a primary truth to tell. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Remember what I said at the beginning about the mission of Jesus in which we share. It has two parts, to serve and to save. We share in the serving but only Jesus saves. And so an essential element of our serving is boldly telling the truth that Jesus alone saves. The ultimate oppressors causing the warping and woundedness of humanity are sin and Satan. Humanity has been sold as slaves to these two powers for thousands of years, for generations upon generations. But Jesus came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many ransom to buy back from the slavery to sin and satan the dismantling of all oppression and the meeting of all needs begin and end in the death and resurrection of jesus and in each person hearing this truth believing it and confessing it calling on the name of the Lord Jesus so that they can be saved. But how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to believe unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of, the one, of those who preach the good news. The call to preach is not just for me. It's not just for Pastor Sally. It's not just for our missionary partner, Yvonne. Can you guess who it's for? (laughs) Yeah, I hope you're squirming a little bit because it is. It's for all of us. All of us are to have beautiful feet. All of us are sent at the end of every Sunday service. If you listen to the words that we pray at the end of every Sunday service, we are sent to go forth into the world with this truth, a bold truth-telling. And it's this bold truth-telling that sets us apart from all the other people and organizations that serve the needy and that seek justice for the oppressed. Because there are many in our country, and I'm thankful for this, there are many people and organizations that are engaged in compassionate actions. And it's a good and necessary thing that they are. As the church, however, we have a unique and essential role in our culture. We provide the missing yet necessary path to ultimate freedom and wholeness, to healing and peace. The gospel. You're experiencing brokenness and need in your life. You're angered and exhausted by the media, by politicians, by systems that are trying to coerce and control you and those whom you love. Good news. There's a different way of being in this world. Good news. There's a truth that cuts through all the chaotic confusion. Good news, there's a life of increasing freedom, wholeness, justice, and delight. And it's as near to you as the hand at the end of your arm. Turn from being convinced that you or anyone else or anything else has the way, the truth, the life. And instead, come to meet Jesus. 
Give him your attention and your allegiance because he himself is the way, the truth, and the life. There's an old-fashioned way of saying this, to quote Jesus. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Bold truth-telling, bold gospel-telling is essential to how we serve others. And so, Emmanuel, as we cross the threshold of our building on Honley Road, which is going to happen in a very few weeks here, as we step into God's future for us, it is imperative that we remember that we do not exist as a church solely for ourselves. Even before I came, when you decided to build this mission outpost, to build this house of worship, one of the guiding principles that you had, I learned this on coming here, is that you were building this building, this structure, for those who were to come, not just for yourselves. This applies to everything that we are doing, everything we're going to be doing as we continue growing into who we are to become. We are Emmanuel, God with us. Thanks be to God for the sake of others. Worshippers of God, growing together in Christ, serving others with humble hearts, through compassionate action, and in bold truth-telling. And we do this so that others, we can bring others to become worshipers of God, who grow together in Christ, who serve others so that those others will become worshipers of God who grow in Christ so that they can serve others, so that those others can become worshipers of God, who grow into Christ, who serve others so that others. Paul says it, the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to reliable people who will be able to teach others also. Again, that's you. <laughs> that's us together. Emmanuel, as we step into the future that God has for us, remember who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. And as you are seated, and before we uh, sing our song that we've been seeing to orient our hearts towards a prayer, and as Michael comes up to lead us in the prayers, uh, praying is one of the primary ways that we serve uh, God and serve his people, and God answers those prayers. Uh, Michael is going to give us a testimony of that. Uh, before we move into our prayers together. Michael, would you please come?
Each morning, <clears throat> I begin my day in prayer. And my first prayer is for my wife. And I ask God to protect her from fear and from pain. This past Tuesday, we had appointments for, at the dentist. And about 2.30, we left the house and we're driving to the dentist on Miniville Road. We cross Smoketown Road and we have to make a U-turn to get into the dentist's uh, parking lot. I don't know what happened to me when I got to that point. I confused or whatever it was, I pulled out into the U-turn when traffic was coming and it was coming fast. And I looked across, as I was hitting the apex of that turn, I looked across, for, across my wife and I saw the, the grill of some huge vehicle, just closer than that, than that microphone over there, and coming like a bat out of hell. And I looked at it, and I thought to myself, I said, I've killed my wife. And in that same instant, I hit the gas to go as fast as I could, but I'm driving a Camry. That's not a fast pickup car. But in that same moment, I felt a thud right in the back of my car. I mean, really felt it, a hard push. And it shoved me over, completed the, the U-turn, and shoved me over to the right lane, which was a turning lane for Smoketown Road, turning to the right. And so I just drove up a little 15 yards and went into the, uh, into the parking lot. I thought, let me go out and see what happened. I went out to look, survey the damage. There was nothing, nothing hit my car, nothing. And I tell you, that was, that was the Holy Spirit and an angel pushing me because I was truly, I, I thought I had killed my wife. I thank God and I praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Meredith, lead us as we sing. Let us pray for the church and the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For Foley, our Archbishop, John, our Bishop, for Chris, our Bishop-elect, and his wife, Catherine, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese, especially Philadelphia Mission and Redeemer Anglican Church, and for our congregation. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, especially our missionary partner, Yvonne, and CCOM. of life church Lord in your mercy for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith especially the body of Christ Jesus in Bangladesh Colombia and Central African Republic Lord in your mercy 
for our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially our President Joe, our Governor Glenn, our Board of County Supervisors, Victor, Andrea, Kenny, Peter, Margaret, Janine, Yesley, and Ann. Lord, in your mercy. For those charged with the protection of our nation and the communities and their families, especially Thomas, Steve, Austin, Bo, Jean, John, Devin, Linnea, Gavin, Christy, Evan, Wes, Dylan, Drew, Andrew, Andrew, and Matthew. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For the readying of our hearts for worship, our welcome and outreach in our house as we move together into God's future for Emmanuel. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those whose lives are closely linked with ours, Jenea, Jade, and Daniel, Steve and Ingrid, Wes, Rachel, and Jake, Clark, Cecily, Amelia, and Elliot, Doris, Mike, Mike and Alex, and their son, Finn, their newborn son. And grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially June, George, Darlene, Tom, Marlene, Bill, Doris, Christina, Tom, Mary, Jason, Jeremiah, Jack, Grace, Kathy, Steve, Kathy, Randy, and Pat, Pat, and the people of Ukraine and Russia. Are there others for whom we should pray? In your mercy. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I invite you to stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. 
please greet one another with a sign of the Lord's peace. Good morning again to everyone. Glad to see you here. Good morning to those of you who are watching from home, or if you're watching this later in the afternoon, good afternoon to you who are watching from home. Glad to have you with us as always. A uh, couple of announcements I, I want to make um, before we have a, a testimony here in a bit. Uh, one is that yesterday uh, was uh, Deacon, Sa uh, wow, that slipped out, Pastor Sally, Pastor Sally and Mike Harpster and Angie, who is not here, uh, your delegates uh, to the electing synod. We were at the synod yesterday where the way that Bishop Murdoch, who was uh, the visiting bishop who was helping walk us through the process, put it well, we weren't there to make a decision, we weren't there to decide, we were there to discern. Who is the man that God has called uh, to follow Bishop John, and actually, better said, to follow Jesus in leading our diocese? And the, the Reverend Christopher Warner uh, is our bishop-elect. Uh, and it just, it's really, for me, and actually all of us, we were there talking about this, so evident, the, uh, the prayerfulness that was a part of the whole process, but particularly yesterday morning. Uh, just really grateful to be there and fully confident uh, that Father Chris is the man that God has called to lead, has his hand on him to, to lead our, our diocese in the years to come. Uh, just some brief words about it. I encourage you to go on the website of the diocese to learn more about uh, Father Chris. Uh, here's a couple of things that they said uh, in the press release that they issued late, uh, later yesterday afternoon. Bishop-elect Warner is the rector of the Church of the Holy Cross, Sullivan's Island, Daniel Island, South Carolina. Prior to his time as rector, he was an associate rector at Church of the Holy Cross, rector at St. Christopher Camp and Conference Center, and curate at Trinity Episcopal Church in Columbus, Georgia. He married Catherine in 1993, and they have three children, 27, 24, and 23. Bishop-elect Warner addressed the delegates saying, I'm honored and humbled to have been selected to serve DOMA as bishop-elect. I'm aware that those of us who serve the Lord in vocational ministry must, must never uh, believe we do so because we qualify. We serve because the Lord calls. And those whom he calls, he then equips. This keeps us dependent upon the Lord, and Jesus receives the glory he rightly deserves. I ask your prayers, and I pledge my prayers for you. I'm truly excited to see what God will do as we serve together in the years to come. So this is our, a few words from our bishop-elect, whom we'll be getting to know in the years to come. And he'll be visiting Emmanuel, I think, in late August, early September of next year is when we get to have his visit to us. Uh, so thank you for your faithful prayers, and if you have more questions about, about the process or anything, grab Mike Harpster, grab, uh, oh, here's Mike behind me, Mike Harpster, Pastor Sally, or me. Andy was our alternate. Andy was well acquainted with the whole election process and just follow it closely, so you can talk to Andy as well if you'd like to learn more about this. Uh, second thing, just uh, continue to update, stay, pay attention to the weekly because every week as far as what's happening with the building, new things are going on and we really are close. Uh, what we, there was an inspection last week, I'm catching Bob and Cloellen's eyes to make sure I get this right, at, with the fire marshal that we did not pass because we needed to install, uh, they just decided we needed to install three more sprinkler heads uh, in the attic space, is that right? And so once that is done this week, that should clear the way. We'll have another inspection, and then that, providing we pass that, that opens the door for, for us to apply for occupancy. So we are, are super close. We don't have it yet, <laughs> so we still, I don't even have a key fob to get in the building myself yet. So none of us can actually go in, except we, would, we do have, we can begin to store a little bit of furniture. And so we have two specific needs uh, for volunteers. Phil, where are you? If you'd come on up, Phil. 
Uh, two specific needs for volunteers this week to help with getting some furniture into the building. And I'll let Phil speak to those two needs. Pastor Travis, uh, we've got a need for two, three to five young backs here in the church. And I say young backs because uh, there's not many of us that are young backs anymore. So young is under 75. <laughs> yeah. Under 72. <laughs> Some of you qualify, some of you don't. But anyways, uh, we've got permission to move the sanctuary chairs into the church on Wednesday. A truck is showing up at the church on Wednesday at around 12 o'clock, and there are 20 boxes of chairs to be unloaded from the truck and wheeled into the sanctuary. Uh, we need three or four more young backs to help with that. Pastor Travis and Scott Anchors have volunteered so far. Pastor Travis concerns himself a young back, so I'll take that. And we also have a need to move a conference table out of Bill Harding's garage. It was moved in there last week. It's a very, very heavy table. It's about eight feet long. And we're gonna meet over at Bill Harding's house around quarter of 11 on Wednesday morning and put that in his truck. And we also need some young backs for that, at least three to four people for that. It'll take that many to get it into his truck. We'll get that into his truck and take it out to the church, and we should be arriving about the same time as the boxes of chairs are arriving at the church. So if you can volunteer and spare some time, uh, please give me a call on my cell phone or send me an email. I know of two people right now who are doing it. I need about three or four more, so that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. And notice it's, uh, he's kept saying young backs. We are an equal opportunity uh, volunteers. Those young backs can be female backs. There are strong women who can also help with that. So please, <laughs> see Phil after the service uh, to, to volunteer to help out with that. Uh, next, I'd like to, uh, any birthdays or anniversaries for this week for us to be able to pray for that would like to come up? Oh, yay. Alan and Joe back just in time <laughs> to receive prayer for their, how many years, y'all? 50 years. Thanks be to God. Wonderful. All right. And we'll pray this for anyone who's at home. Extend your hands and let's pray together for this beloved couple. Watch over your children, O oh Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up when they fall. And in their hearts may your peace which passes understanding Abide all the days of their lives. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Do it. Uh, when we, we went to uh, Napa and Sonoma Valley with my cousin who was married the same year. So we we're celebrating our 50th anniversaries. Uh, she blabbed everywhere we went, every store we went into, every restaurant. We're celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary. So three times someone asked me, and the one I remember is a young girl said, well, what's your secret? And I said, Jesus. And there was nothing more to say. And I said it, I think, three times. That this week. I don't think I've ever said that or had the opportunity to say it, but God gave me the opportunity to give him the praise. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Bold truth telling, being alert for the opportunity to do that simply and clearly. Um, one more example of service. I'm asking uh, Melissa is going to come up. Uh, you know, we've been having a testimony each week about these areas. How has Emmanuel helped you to worship, to grow, and to grow as one who serves? And Melissa's going to share uh, from her life. All right. So I was asked to talk about serve this morning. Um, and this is just, over the week, this was a meaningful opportunity for me to reflect on how God has worked in my life and in the life of Emmanuel. Um, Emmanuel is and has been involved with many meaningful organizations over the years. I mean, you all know this, but 
the, our missionary partner, Yvonne, was here a few weeks ago, Acts. CCOM, and we've said that CCOM a couple times today, it's the Cooperative Council of Ministries. Um, Life First Pregnancy Resource Center, doing meals at Hilda Barg, and within our diocese. But this morning I want to talk to you about um, how God called me and has called Emmanuel to minister specifically to schools, um, King Elementary School. So when our daughter Lillian was in kindergarten, Um, I loved helping in her classroom. Her teacher was so welcoming, so I was there a lot just just helping out. Each morning, the children would come in and they would pick up their school breakfast in a bag and they would take it to their classrooms. They would eat it right there in their classroom at their their table. And one morning, when I was coming in to volunteer, some of the children were not quite done eating and it was time to clean up. So I brought the trash over to um, get any trash from the kids. I noticed that they were kind of rolling them up and putting them in their backpacks. And when I asked, they explained that they were going to take them home that evening and have them for dinner. So at that moment, I felt God tug my heart. About a week later, I was talking with the guidance counselor, and she mentioned that it was too bad there wasn't a way to provide meals for kids on the weekend. Some kids didn't eat on the weekend, and they would come to school very hungry on Monday morning. God tugged at my heart. A few weeks later, I talked to the chairperson of our outreach and missions team, and I was invited to a meeting. While I was there, um, I asked if this is a ministry that Emmanuel would be able to help with. And the response was, we have been trying to get a hold um, of local schools and do this very thing. The outreach team had been praying about how they can get involved with schools, and they actually wanted to start a weekend food program. That was another tug at my heart. In a short time, we came together and we packed food in bags, which which go inside the kids' backpacks to take home each weekend. This is how Backpack for Kids started. It wasn't anything that the outreach team did. It wasn't anything I did on our own. It wasn't even something that I even dreamed of. (laughs) But it was a God dream. God knew there was a way, and with each step, there was a plan for Emmanuel to provide for these kids. But he didn't stop there. That year, a women's Bible study started a coat drive for kids um, who needed coats and hats and gloves to stay warm in the winter. The following year, God lined up Rock the Block, an annual event where we hand out backpacks, school supplies, and we get to know our neighbors. Um, Next, he made connections where Emmanuel has volunteers who go in and help teachers and students right there in the classroom. God has showed me that we can meet people where they are. This, is, um, this can be pr- providing practical needs, like food and school supplies and help in the classroom, but it can also be so much more. When we serve, sometimes we know exactly what happens. We hear the testimonies, and sometimes we have no idea what spiritual needs God is meeting. We have no idea how God can use a bag of food, a backpack, or an hour on a Wednesday morning to grow his kingdom. One of my favorite prayers from Every Moment Holy, and I'm sure some of you who have served um, at events and stuff have heard this, so I'm going to say it again, though. Um, It's from a liturgy before serving others, and the prayer ends like this. I cannot know the end of another person's story. Our lives so often only briefly intersect. So let me be content to minister regardless of the visible outcomes, trusting that the small mercies I extend will be woven into the larger theme of redemption at work in the lives of others as you woo them to yourself, drawing their hearts by graces offered and shaping my own heart too in the process of learning to serve well and by learning to serve well, learning to love well. Something else that stuck out to me as I reflected is that this is not a ministry that somebody just woke up and decided to do. This is a ministry where God called and we answered. When we are aware of God's calling us, where God is calling us to move forward, we can be obedient and we can say yes to where he is guiding us. When we serve, our hearts are being shaped to look outward and upward. When we first started Backpack for Kids, we had no idea how we were going to afford this and we had no idea who was going to help with it. But we relied on God and his people, you all. And since... Uh, Backpack for Kids started in 2017. We've delivered thousands of weekend food bags. 
Only God could take a tug of a heart in a kindergarten classroom and turn it into a ministry that glorifies him and reminds us that he will provide. Now, I can't come up here and talk about serving without asking for help. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, if you're interested in helping in a kindergarten or an elementary school classroom once a week, let me know. You can actually pick what age you want to work with and what time you want to come in, and they'll work it out with teachers. Um, or if you'd like to help with packing food or delivering food, let me know. Or if you have resources to buy food and bring it to church on Sunday morning. These are all ways that you are invited to join in his work. And of course, there's many of you that are sitting here that do this every, every week. So um, I'd like to thank those who have served and have provided for your faithfulness. So as Emmanuel continues to be molded as individuals and as a church community, community might we pay attention to the tugs might we talk about them with each other and pray about them? Might we share them with the outreach and missions team, which is a group, group of people leading our mission effort? So I'll end with this question. Is there an area in the life of Emmanuel, in Prince William County, or in the world where God might be tugging at your heart? Amen. And thank you, Melissa. As she was talking, I was reminded one of the other things that Jesus says as far as how he serves. And John, he always says, I only do what it is that I see the Father doing. Uh, or to use the words of a servant of Jesus named Melissa, I only do what I see the experience, the tug of the Father tugging. So pay attention to those tugs and talk to us about them. And one of the final tugs that we're talking about this morning, uh, I'm putting this basket up here on the altar. Uh, for our, our opportunity to bring our pledge cards uh, to the Lord, the testimonies that you've been hearing, part of the reason we're telling those stories is to remind you that when you partner with God through your giving, this is what happens as a result. These stories that we've heard of how people have been shaped at Emmanuel and how Emmanuel has worked, uh, God has worked in them, in and through Emmanuel together. So as we've, I think it's become pretty much our, our tradition now as far as how we handle this. Uh, when you can take your pledge cards, if you brought them with you, the baskets will be passed down for offering as usual, and you can put your pledge cards there. Or if you would like to use this as an opportunity to, before the Lord, to come and to offer your pledge as a way of also offering your whole life to the Lord and placing it in the basket during the offering time, you may do that as well. So either put your pledge cards in the basket or put them, uh, and put them in the baskets or put them in the, the plates that go by. If you don't have pledge cards with you and you would like one, raise your hand. Uh, the ushers have, the, have some here. Anybody want to need one? So one over here, Gary. And you'll notice if you receive those, uh, the dates on them, they're from um, past years, but they still will work. <laughs> What's that? Oh, these are the good ones. Never mind them. We've got enough of the good ones then. Great. All right. Well, ascribe unto the Lord the honor due unto his name. Bring offerings and come into his courts.
God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. The Lord loves you, Emmanuel, and is deeply pleased with your generosity and your gratefulness and your givingness in response to his givingness to you. <laughs> the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is your living word from before time and for all ages. By him you created all things, and by him you make all things new. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. be seated. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death, we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat, 
This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he said to them, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Alleluia. Family, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. Live for you.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. Live for you. Oh, live for you. Of my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill with your heart and me in your love to those around me. Worthy every song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe live for you oh live for you and holy there is no Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in love to those around you. Upon your it is a firm foundation and I put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken and I will build my life upon your love.
There's the sermon summarized in the hymn. <laughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we, many, a body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom, and now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Scott, to whom are you going? Scott. We now send you out to share communion this week with Tom and Kathy, who are unable to be here. Carry the prayers of all of us as you take this sacrament of Christ's presence. We are many, or one body, because we share one cup. One cup. Amen. Now, go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ
Alleluia, alleluia. Let us go forth into the word, world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Child shall lead them. <laughs>